In early 2019, I finally came to grips with the fact that there was a huge hole in my skill set as a quality A1. I was getting pretty good at mixing, learning new consoles, I could even A2 a bit, in corporate settings, a new RF, I could be active on stage. But when it came to sound system design, tuning, and deployment, there was a hole. <laughs> I knew that I needed to put speakers up on sticks or maybe a few constant curvature array boxes up in the air and point them at people. But other than playing some test tracks and listening to see if it sounded good and using a little bit of graphic EQ, that was all I had. Um, I had a lot of confidence in other areas, but just found myself guessing there. So I decided to dive in because at the end of the day, I couldn't answer questions like, how many speakers do you need for a specific design and why? Why would I choose to place my subwoofers left and right versus the center? Or how would I space them across the stage if I need to do it that way? Or if I need to delay speakers, at what point in the room do I need to place them? How powerful they need to be and where do I aim them? I couldn't answer that, so I needed a guide to hold my hand and teach me this. So that's why I bought Bob McCarthy's book, The Green Bible, on August 23rd, 2019. So I had it shipped to me, the tome that it is. This huge green mamma jamma. I read it cover to cover. It took me several months, but I did it. And the output of that was my audio mass survival spreadsheet, which I'm sure you heard me talk about. I made this so it could contain this tome of information in one place where it could use all these handy formulas and cal calculations uh, that Bob and others have put together, and I remixed some of my own. Almost exactly two years later to the day after I bought Bob's book, I published my first YouTube video on this channel. And it's cool to see, even from that point on, how much has changed and evolved in my thinking. Uh, I never claimed to be an expert on the craft at that point, and I, I still don't, but it merely served as a place where I could share what I was learning and maybe help others in the same position. Because at the end of the day, the internet's the wild west, who knows what you can trust, and, and definitely do your own fact checking, but I wasn't finding a whole lot of sources that was making this craft that seemed very high and above me applicable to my setting and on my shows. The more I started to learn and dive in, the more some of my misconceptions about the craft were challenged. So let's fast forward another two years, another 97 YouTube videos, uh, and a few hundred more gigs, and it's today, August 2023. So what I wanted to do is after showing you this, this journey of thinking I have of three main misconceptions about the craft that I had dead wrong. And I think still many audio engineers in the craft who may be afraid to dip their toes in this still have it too. So today I hope to maybe change some of you good audio humans minds uh, about the fact that this might be unapproachable or unobtainable. So it, it's not about trying to convince you that it is good, but merely share with you how I was able to change my career and my understanding of how was I able to bring a better product to my clients and my audiences. So let's jump in with point number one. First up, I thought it was complicated, expensive, and time consuming. I saw engineers making decisions about things they could not see, reading data that looked like a snake game on steroids, and twiddling knobs on a black box, I really couldn't understand what it was doing. So this made it seem really unapproachable and impossible. And after looking at Bob's book, yes, it's 579 pages of basically type 7.5 and a half uh, font. <laughs> and, uh, it's a lot of information. So it really does feel overwhelming at times. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of math involved. I, I personally barely made it past my junior year pre-calculus. At my high school, we didn't even have to take math our senior year. And I took a lip math for liberal arts uh, course in college. So if that tells you how math was not my thing early on, I really was intimidated. But uh, I'm here to say that you really don't have to know all that much. And that's a, that's a little bit different these days. And I hope my YouTube channel has been able to show you that uh, and show you on these shows that, yes, at points, if you're early on your journey, it may seem like I'm speaking above your head, but you can learn this, you can dig in, and you can move forward. 
Second up is that it is expensive. I would see tours come through or maybe bigger gigs where I'd be an A2 or something lower on and have these Earthworks microphones, these fancy interfaces and multiple instances of smart and other softwares. And again, there's nothing wrong with nice gear, uh, but I felt like that was the caliber of rig that you needed to be able to tune any system. And that's simply not true. We now live in a day and age where you can build a quality rig, get a nice mic and interface and the software for less than three hundred dollars uh, there's open source stuff out there there's there's plenty of options so you can definitely jump in and get started that was something i didn't know and wish i knew when i first started Lastly is that it is time consuming and I, I'm so excited when I get to see my good friend Michael Lawrence bust this myth. He's been doing this for a while and he is a, uh, in some ways he's superhuman, but his method is something that I use all the time and I see more and more engineers start to adopt and how they approach systems. But he regularly tunes arena s sound systems in 17 minutes which is crazy. I, I, I used to see these tours come through or be on shows where the A1 would be blasting pink for an hour, sometimes more. And we just don't have that type of time or we start losing friends because no one can hear and talk while they're on the gig. So moving quick and with precision is really big deal. You need to create a plan you need to become fluid with your tools and know how to prioritize your decisions. It's it's quite attainable to become as fast as Michael. You know, he's got a ton of reps. He really knows his stuff. Uh, he's always looking to get better, but you too can learn this and get that quickly and get that fast. Um, you know, it's a good thing that I'm done now before everyone comes back from lunch, right? Uh, some people have questions. You're like, wait, you already tuned it? But yeah, it's, it's, it's there. It's done correctly. And you can be efficient and get good results. Misconception number two, system tuning is mostly EQ, right? That's pretty intuitive for someone looking from the outside in to think about it. Because at the end of the day, what do we see most engineers doing with their tuning? They're usually listening to some music, maybe playing pink noise, looking at a screen and using EQ to make it flat. That is, at the end of the day, the, the biggest caricature of the craft that we see. But I believe starting with EQ is starting with a solution, not starting with the root problem. It's putting the cart before the horse. So what does EQ mean? EQ means to equalize, to make even. And yes, that is something we're doing with system tuning, but I think it's thinking through the solution, not starting with the problem. And problems can be addressed by asking really good questions. So in my mind, there are five core questions we're asking as systems engineers or front of house engineers who are responsible for the system that can help lead us in the right direction. And those five are, is each individual speaker performing as expected? Are the results of the sound system delivering on what my design promised? What is the tonal variance across my audience area? What is the level variance across my audience area? And finally, does the system sound good? How can we use our ears to make final tweaks to make it balanced? So once the design phase is done, it's our job as systems engineers when we are in tuning mode to make sure all these questions are answered and help it bring up any problems that we might need to solve. If it's not even front to back in regards to tonality, we at least now know if we're able to measure it. We've done our due diligence to make sure every part of the system is working correctly. Um, hopefully we did have a design coming in. Sometimes we don't have that luxury, but we at least look at what's going on, assess the goals of the show, then use our tools to measure and get the correct data to answer these questions. So at the end of the day, EQ is one common tool in the toolbox that helps us solve these problems, but it's not the end all be all and not even the main event of what's happening. Sure, we do spend some time here, but we just need to see it within this entire workflow that we call system tuning to ensure that we're getting great results uh, out of our PA for our clients. Even before AI has become this exploding topic and like it has in recent days, we have been relying on computers to do things for us. Even using the system measurement software that he use all the time, Smart, it's running a discrete Fourier transform under the hood so I don't have to. I love computers, I love that they do things for us so I can work more efficiently. However, there is a trend that's been around a bit that I've seen early and is still permeating through our culture and it goes to something like this. 
uh, well, you know, the people who made these products, uh, these Brainiacs over in France, are really smart and they know a lot more than I do. So I'm just going to trust the buttons that they give us. So, you know, we need to plug in a few numbers uh, into the software auto solver and hit go. Uh, I need to hang the rig like the robot says. I need to push out the recommended filters and have it do the EQing for me. And then I sit at front of house and hope none of the touring engineers ask for changes. I'm knowing I'm going a bit overboard. I promise I'm not trying to pick on this specific manufacturer, but that's how we've come to take these tools. Cause I, I don't even think L Acoustics, I'm just gonna go out and say it, would say that's how these tools should be used. I think they want to empower people. At least that's me assuming good intention on their part to put these tools on my hands, uh, in our hands as system engineers, but they're there to give us a starting point for us to tweak. And then we still have to verify it in the field. So here's my, my further rubs with this ideology because um, as far as I know these processes are still an algorithm so how algorithms are different than AI is an algorithm is as a human figured this out and said hey computer I have the solution run this solution AI the human says to it hi computer I have no idea what's right you run all these environments to test and see what is the best and you come up with the best one so with an algorithm when you're hitting an auto solver or like a hey do it for me button it's still someone else deciding in advance how it should go. Of course, they made it, they know their products, but they don't know your preferences, they don't know your design goals. They're just going in general what their product is supposed to do over a given coverage area. So it's okay to agree with where it ended up or even use it as a launching pad, but don't get lazy and not do the work yourself or at least verify what's going on. Uh, because not even measuring the system, even if you'd like the design it came up with, um, you, know, you know, we still like to measure our power distros right before we plug in you know a half a million dollar pa into something that's running at 240 instead of 120 and our amps are not <laughs> uh switching power supplies right uh you when why wouldn't you measure your system it's a good idea to things that are critical to our show to know if they're working correctly because i don't know about you but i can't hear absolute polarity so if we don't know if our front fills and our mains uh have polarity inverted on one of the cables running to them then we might have weird awkward results when they're crossing over each other I recently found seven polarity inversions out of 20 speakers in a recent install project I was called in to help tune and redo the integrator's work. So guess who is not getting called again by this company who has a lot of venues. Transparency is becoming more and more valued in our culture. We get rewarded for showing our work and it's not good enough to say, hey, the computer told me this is what I should do, so I did it. Um, I think, again, it's a helpful starting point. We should use those tools, but you need to be a leader in your craft. So I encourage you to dive in, take measurements, and know for yourself that something is working. I know I sound like a boomer. Uh, I promise this is not a rant, but I'm, I'm just tired of mistakes and lackadaisical attitudes at these you know, million dollar PA systems where people are paying a lot of money to be there and they're sitting around all morning. So. If you enjoy the craft, get up, do the work, take some measurements, and see what we can come up with. All right, let's land this plane. The three things uh, that I had big misconceptions about uh, that I've now changed over these last four years. That system tuning has a proven process. It can be done quickly and affordably. And you can do the same. You can learn this. You could get a, a mighty but small rig, and you can learn with speed and precision. Number two, although EQ is a very powerful tool, it must be couched within a coherent workflow. It is not the end all be all. It's not literally the filter we're looking at everything through. We need to see its proper place in solving the correct problems in the right order. Number three, lean on computers when they are useful. Do the work when they are not. I understand the irony of this, of I'm talking to you through a computer right now, but uh, I know the AI bots are probably after me, but do the work, learn the craft, trust your ears after you've done the measurement. My name is Michael Curtis. I love helping you make it sound amazing in every seat. Hope this was helpful to you, show to where I, how far I've come in four years, and I hope to keep growing and learning and sharing with you. Let me know how this was in the comments below. I'll see you next time.